Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. John DeLynn. It is January 7th, 2021. And I, uh, I am sharing with you today kind of a special edition of Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am the host of a podcast called Mormon Stories, where we try to explore, uh, challenge uh, Mormonism, Orthodox Mormonism. Um, it's for uh it's for all types of Mormons, but particularly for open-minded Mormons, questioning Mormons, progressive Mormons, and post-Mormons. Anyway, um, I, uh, I, it is the day after uh, the insurrection here in the United States where uh, Donald Trump uh, gave a, called a, uh, he basically called a um, kind of a big uh, protest you know, right down the street from our nation's capital. Uh, he it, it was scheduled during the time that Congress was uh, certifying the Electoral College uh, here in the United States, uh, of course, which was going to lead to a certification of Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris uh, being chosen as the next president, vice president of the United States. And during that, uh, during that protest, during that speech that Donald Trump gave, he, he denounced Vice President Pence, he denounced, you know, Republican leadership that supported uh, the vote, and he incited and encouraged his followers and supporters at this presentation to march to the nation's capital, where then uh, they invaded the nation's capital, uh, broke into it, uh, caused all sorts of vandalism and destruction while Congress was in session. Uh, at least four people died as a result of those actions. And it's it's been condemned by Republicans and Democrats alike, uh, including, uh, you know, um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, you know, including uh, Republican Mormon uh, Senator Mitch, Mitt Romney and many, many others. Now today, several uh, members of Donald Trump's cabinet are resigning. He's being called for impeachment, et cetera. And uh, as somebody who loves our country, who loves America, as someone who was raised Mormon, and, um, and as somebody who was a political science major and who personally worked on Capitol Hill, so I have walked through those hallowed halls of the Congress building. I've personally done an internship for a congressman, and I've always considered myself uh, someone who loves this country and who wants to see it um, be and do healthy things. Uh, I was super shook and saddened by what I experienced yesterday. Uh, and um, I decided that what I wanted to do was try and at least do my part to speak up and, and kind of try and explore a little bit how this happened uh, to our country. And, um, and give my best thoughts on how we could prevent this sort of stuff from happening again. And it was kind of impossible for me not to look at this through a Mormon lens, both because I'm Mormon, raised Mormon, uh, think about Mormonism all the time. That's kind of what I do. That's that's my focus. But also, um, it, it was impossible not to notice that there were active believing Mormons participating well, uh, participating in yesterday's insurrection. There was at least one flag being waved that was a direct quote uh, from the Book of Mormon, Mormon scripture, uh, that was taken from chapter, you know, Book of Mormon scripture around Captain Moroni, um, <clears throat> who is a, a central Book of Mormon figure. But also there were uh, participants there with BYU out, you know, BYU garb. And, uh, and there were people harassing Mitt Romney at the airport, flying to this event. And, uh, you know, and there are Mormon politicians like Burgess Owens that support Donald Trump uh, or that historically have supported Trump, like like uh, Senator Mike Lee and others. So uh, there's no way to take out the Mormonism from what happened yesterday, uh, good and bad. And, and so what I've done is I've prepared a presentation for today. I hope it's not too lengthy. I'm calling it how bad religion uh, and or Orthodox Mormonism has both groomed us for Trumpism and has shown us how to defeat it. 
so that is that is what my presentation is going to be about today. I do want to provide a few disclaimers, if that's all right. Here are my disclaimers. Uh, I am not uh, a member of what's called the radical left. Uh, I am not a, a super liberal Democrat by any stretch of the imagination. I consider myself to be politically moderate. Uh, I sympathize with values and policies on both sides of the political spectrum. I think there's uh, there are reasonable reasons to be conservative, to be a Republican, and to be liberal, and to be a Democrat. And uh, I sympathize with with uh, lots of different uh, policies and values across the spectrum. I am literally a registered Republican in the state of Utah. Uh, I, uh, if I could have chosen between Mitt Romney and Joe Biden uh, for president, uh, there's a chance I, I would have uh, preferred Mitt Romney. I'm not the biggest Joe Biden fan in the world by any stretch of the imagination. I do like a lot about Kamala Harris, but she's not perfect either. Um, you know, but in the past, I've I've voted for both Republican and Democrat presidents over the years. Um, so that's all true about me. But I uh, I wanted to see John Huntsman, uh, a moderate uh, or progressive Republican, become governor in Utah, and that's why I registered as a Republican. So you really can't claim I'm part of the radical left. Um, I consider myself moderate and a registered Republican in Utah. And then I just want to state that my my focus is on the collective good, uh, the good of American society, the good of, of the global society of the world. That's what I care about most, more than any party, more than any politician, um, et cetera. But the thing that I also feel very strongly is I'm anti-fascism. Uh, I studied World War II. I named one of my children after Winston Churchill. Uh, I've studied uh, FDR and World War II, JFK. Um, I, I'm pro-civil rights and I'm anti-fascism. And, and those things are really important to me. And that's the slant from which I'm coming from. So I'm not here to attack people who voted Republican or even voted for Trump per se, but I am vocally denouncing what I'm calling Trumpism, which I am equating with fascism. And uh, I'm going to sort of make that argument um, now. Okay, so with those disclaimers out of the way, um, what I want to start with is a fact and uh, or, or a set of facts that I think are facts. And if you disagree with me, you can uh, share the evidence. But the facts that I want to share today are things that are disturbing to me as a Mormon, as a post-Mormon, as a progressive Mormon, and as a Utah. And these facts are that Donald Trump Donald Trump has very strong support in Utah. I would, uh, it's my understanding that Utah is in the top 10 states in the country, um, both to vote Republican and to support Trump. If I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But at least historically, Trump has had very strong support um, in Utah. He's polled very well here. And, uh, and Mormons, as I understand it, uh, support Trump at higher rates than almost any other major religious group, other than I think white conservative evangelical Christians. But again, you have to make them all white to uh, elevate that group. Because if you go with uh, with uh, evangelical Christians of color, I think they drop below Mormons. So historically, as I understand it, Mormons disproportionately support uh, historically Trump. And um, I think that's also true just about uh, conservative Christians. So take the Mormon element out of it. If you look at the most ardent Trump supporters, I think there's a high correlation between conservative Christianity and Trump and Mormonism and Trump. So these things are facts, and they're disturbing to me as someone who was raised Christian, someone who was raised Mormon, and as someone who's in Utah. Um, so, uh, starting with those facts, then the, what I want to do now is lay out my best explanation because I'm, I'm just super curious. Like, how is it that a church that I, uh, was raised in that I believe, uh, you know, believes in kindness, believes in truth, believes in love, who claims to follow Jesus. Um, how can that same church be so supportive of, of Trump and or what I think is fascism. Again, a church that I was raised in that was really pro-Constitution, really pro-America. Um, you know, how 
is this possible? And how are so many people who claim to be devout Christians or even Orthodox Christians, how are so many Christians disproportionately supporting Trump? Uh, that's that's kind of what I'm asking myself. And I am uh, here to make the argument today that I believe that Orthodox Mormonism and uh, conservative Christianity, in a way, grooms us for um, for supporting potentially Trumpism and or what what seems to be bordering on fascism. And here's here's my argument. I'm going to make it from a Mormon perspective. And then if any of you who are from evangel who are from a Christian background want to either agree or disagree with me from your Christian backgrounds, I, I would love to hear that too, because I don't have strong evidence, you know, about the evangelical Christian perspective or the Catholic perspective or other types of perspective. I can only sort of share this from uh, from a Mormon perspective. So what I'm now going to do is I am going to give my best argument for um, how, how Mormonism, I believe, and possibly conservative Christianity has groomed us for Trumpism. So uh, let me begin by sharing what I see with what I call Trumpism. What do I see? Here's what I see. I see leaders and followers of Trump who place excessive faith in a charismatic leader. If I had to say the best example of that yesterday were many of these uh, rioters who went to the nation's capital, took down American flags, and put up Trump flags. Um, it appears as though uh, these people love Trump potentially even more than they love the Constitution. They seem to love Trump more than uh, the three branches of government, the separation of powers, and they, they are willing to suspend potentially uh, the balance of power, the democratic process, um, and so much that we as Americans and the Constitution seem to hold sacred in support of a charismatic leader being Trump. And again, if you don't believe me, just Google, you know, the, the protesters yesterday that literally took the American flag down, flipped the American flag upside down, and or put up Trump flags in its place. But that's the biggest concern is an excessive reliance, you know, within Trumpism on a charismatic leader. The second, uh, the second element of Trumpism that I see is uh, institutional intolerance of criticism. And if you know, my, my understanding of Trumpism and how Trump works is he despises disloyalty and criticism over anything else. And that is what's made it so Republicans, conservatives, moderates have been so terrified uh, to speak out against him. And anyone who has dared to speak out against Trump or his administration has been fired has been demonized, has been vilified, uh, uh, and has been you know unseated in in office. So uh, my understanding is the way that Trump has such a lock on the political process is by making people terrified to ever criticize him. That's my understanding. Okay, the third element of Trumpism that I see are leaders and followers who value their beliefs more than evidence and who embrace baseless conspiracy theories. And for me, there, there's all sorts of examples of this. There's, there's significant anti-science uh, rhetoric within Trump followers. There's anti-journalism uh, disposition with Trump followers. They hate the media. They hate all the forms of media that don't agree with them. They hate science. They, they question uh, you know, the National Institute of Health, the, the value of wearing masks, the validity of COVID as, as a legitimate virus. Um, and they embrace very harmful conspiracy theories, whether it's, you know, uh, Obama and birther conspiracies, whether it's Pizzagate, whether it's QAnon, whether it's conspiracy theories about the election. Um, you know, Trump was saying that there was election fraud before the election was even held. He was telling people that the election was going to be fraudulent if he lost. Um, and he was stirring up, uh, uh, you know, theories and conspiracy theories before the election had even happened. And then, of course, his followers believed those conspiracy theories, along with QAnon, along with Pizzagate, um, along with, uh, you know, allegations about Antifa um, and Obama's birth certificate and all these things. 
and it, it, it has left our country with a bunch of people who believe in conspiracy theories more than they believe in science, in facts, in credible journalism, and in evidence. That's just my, uh, that's my personal opinion, and I think that's uh, left us in a very damaging uh, and destructive place. Um, another element of Trumpism is leaders and followers who use divisive rhetoric. And uh, one of the most disheartening things for me, I watch several hours of Donald Trump uh, stump speeches or campaign speeches, and I have literally never beheld a more divisive and mean-spirited uh, public figure, politician, leader in my 51 years upon this earth. Crude, rude, profane, mean, divisive rhetoric and speech, and that's uh, that's what I associate with uh, everything that I've heard from Donald Trump, and and uh, I've never seen anything like it. And if you have, I'd love to see. I don't care who you talk about: George Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, uh, Linda B. Johnson, John F. Kennedy, FDR. J Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, go back to Lincoln. Find me a politician that's ever been as crude, as disrespectful, as harsh, as mean, um, as as base as Donald Trump, it, it, elected or unelected. Worse than David Duke. Like, I literally have never seen anything like it. And that's part of uh, what I call damaging Trumpism. The next bullet, leaders and followers who pick vulnerable minorities and who stoke bigotry as a way to unify their followers. For those of you who have been following Trump, he is critical of our most vulnerable um, and marginalized populations. I'm talking about people of color. I'm talking about Hispanics. I'm talking about African Americans. I'm talking about uh, gay and lesbian people. I'm talking about transgender people. I'm talking about women, victims of assault and sexual abuse. Pick, he's even made fun of, of uh, people with disabilities. Like pick your, you know, pick immigrants, pick any group, any population that um, is traditionally hurt or underprivileged or disempowered or disenfranchised or have been systematically abused. Donald Trump has made them a central focus of his rhetoric and targets of his abuse. Um, and uh, and all of that. And I, I think that's horrific. And I think that he does that because that's a typical ploy of fascists to garner, to make an enemy, and then to garner support of his followers, to hate something, to target something, and to have unity in something to fight against. Uh, the next thing that I see uh, with Donald Trump and Trumpism is leaders and followers who stay silent out of fear of going against the opinions of their tribe and who value their own perceived immediate self-interest over the long-term interests of the greater community. Look at Mitch McConnell, look at Lindsey Graham, uh, look at you know most of the Republican members of the House and the Senate. You, you until yesterday, you literally found almost, with a, with a very few exceptions, and one that we're going to talk about in a second that has a very important Mormon connection, with very few exceptions, um, you will find almost no Republicans or conservatives who are willing to publicly challenge or disagree with or oppose Donald Trump until yesterday, until Trump incited a riot that invaded our nation's capital and threatened the lives of Congress people while they were in session certifying the electoral process against him. Um, and, and, and that's a problem. Uh, too many silent followers that are not courageous and they're not willing to speak truth to power out of fear, out of protecting their own political interests, their own social interests, their own monetary interests, their own financial or business interests, just being cowardly and, and quiet uh, how many people have I talked to, even in my own family, even my own friends, who are like, yeah, we all hate Trump, but but I'm not going to say anything publicly about it. That's pretty much almost every Trump supporter and Republican I've ever uh, spoken with. The final element of Trumpism that I condemn that I see are leaders and followers who encourage and or engage in violence. And if you haven't believed it before, you only have to see what happened yesterday yesterday. You had all of these people 
who were at Trump's rally with Trump flags, with Confederate flags, listening to Trump, cheering Trump on, and then Trump literally leads them, even though he and his family like ran away at the last minute and bunkered up in, in the White House, he leads them to the Capitol building where then they incite and engage in violence on the nation's capital. And if you are going to believe the garbage that those people were Antifa, that's stupid conspiracy theory garbage because these people were at Trump's rally. He led them to the nation's capital. Then they invaded the nation's capital. Then Trump said in his public statement, I love them uh, and your special people. I love you. And he, you know, and, and he sort of endorsed and validated all those people there that were doing the violence. So stop, stop stating that the violent people yesterday were Antifa. That's the stupid, uh, horrific, garbage conspiracy theory noise that I'm condemning today. So having said all that, these are the elements of Trumpism. And so now... Uh, now I want to take this to what in the world does any of this have to do with Mormonism? And I argue that we as Mormons and possibly as conservative Christians have been especially groomed to be vulnerable to this type of uh, fascism and what I'll call Trumpism. And I'm now going to draw these same parallels. You could ask, how in the world would anyone become susceptible to all these things? Well, I'll tell you, if you are born and raised into a conservative religious tradition that parallels um, in many ways the uh, devices and the techniques and the structures of sort of Trumpist fascism, you're going to be more vulnerable to it. And now I would just like to humbly make the case for why a bad form, and I'm not saying all forms of Mormonism, I'm not saying all forms of conservative Christianity, I'm going to say a certain orthodox or ultra-conservative or fundamentalist view of Mormonism and or Christianity can lead to uh, make make a group of people susceptible to uh, this sort of fascism and Trumpism. So here's here's the argument again. Um, you know, when I think about Mormonism, do I think Mormonism encourages um, leaders and followers who place excessive faith in charismatic leaders? Absolutely. In Mormonism, we worship almost Joseph Smith. We worship. Uh, our, our prophets, seers, and revelators. When Russell M. Nelson or any of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve or the First Presidency come in the room, everyone needs to stand. <clears throat> we sing Follow the Prophet. We sing um, hymns that encourage us to uh, worship and obey and follow these leaders. And we are taught um, as an institution that it is actually evil to criticize our leaders. As Mormons, we take covenants. We actually, um, we actually make temple covenants to never quote speak ill of the Lord's anointed. We have Dallin H. Oaks publicly saying that it's wrong to criticize our church leaders, even if the criticisms are accurate. And of course, the Mormon Church has a two hundred, you know, ish year legacy of of punishing, silencing, and even excommunicating its critics. And I happen to be one of the critics that the Mormon church has excommunicated along with many dear friends. And so you can see that parallel of undying, uncritical devotion of leaders and a total institutional intolerance of criticism as two pillars of Mormon Orthodox Mormonism and of Trumpism. Uh, the, the a third uh, bullet that I parallel that I see between uh, Orthodox Mormonism and Trumpism is again leaders and followers who value their beliefs more than evidence and who embrace baseless conspiracy theories um, over over facts and truth and and Mormonism is replete with with this. I was taught from a young age to question science, to be suspicious of science that. That faith is superior to evidence. There, there's in Mormonism, we're groomed to have suspicion for the learned. Um, that faith is better than than evidence and and facts and knowledge. 
I was taught that evolution is wrong. I was taught that the earth is 6,000 years old. I was taught that, um, that, that those who teach evolution are teaching heresy. Um, and, and as far as, uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, uh, the conspiracy theories, if you think about it, the fact that that Joseph Smith started the one true church, that the Book of Mormon itself is a is a um, historical document, that it's an ancient document, that the Book of Mormon, that the Book of Abraham is an, is an ancient document. Um, all of these things are conspiracy theories that have no real basis in truth, and all of the scientific evidence points to the opposite. But because these conspiracy theories are important parts of our beliefs, then we do somersaults flipping over backwards to try and bolster you know, the, the historicity of the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham or the truthfulness or the absolute truthfulness of the Mormon church when science and evidence all run counter. Mormonism also has an anti-journalism slant where they either avoid uh, speaking openly to journalists or they try and uh, destroy or harm uh, journalistic institutions like the Salt Lake Tribune or they try and buy it up and water it down. Um, but but there is absolutely anti-journalist, anti-journalistic or sentiments and or suspicion within Mormonism. And of course, uh, the church is against its scholars. It's against its critics. Um, and, and it does, and it engages in that by punishing them, by polishing us, by punishing us. And just like Trump has spokespeople who uh, make excuses um, and, and gaslight its people, the Mormon church has deceptive apologetics, whether it's uh, Farms, Hugh Nibley, whether it's the Maxwell Institute, whether it's Fair Mormon, whether it's Quaku, whether it's Cardinalis, uh, the, the Mormon church, in, even in a surrogate way through these nonprofits, through the More Good Foundation, uh, Book of Mormon Central, the interpreter, they use spokespeople and uh, nonprofits and apologetic groups to brainwash the public, to brainwash its members um, in, in ways that are anti-journalistic, anti-scientific, and anti-critics. So uh, th th this is all stuff that Mormons, unfortunately, know way too well. Uh, again, um, the Mormon church is filled with people who embrace baseless conspiracy theories. I've already made this point, but whether it's Joseph Smith's divine calling is God's one true prophet, there are way too many problems with Joseph Smith uh, sleeping with underage girls, sleeping with 14, 15, 16-year-olds, marrying other men's wives, defrauding people out of money, claiming to translate documents that he hasn't translated. The Joseph Smith, the core Joseph Smith narrative is in and of itself a baseless, harmful conspiracy theory. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't some good that's come from it, or even if you want to believe there's some divinity in it. But there is way too many problems with Joseph Smith and its history to not also see it on its face value as a baseless, harmful conspiracy theory. That's true for the Book of Mormon. That's true for the Book of Abraham. That's true for Joseph Smith's polygamy. And that's true for the LDS Church's claim of being the one true church. The next, um, the next uh, parallel between Trumpism and Mormonism is people who use divisive rhetoric. If you look at speeches given in Mormon general conferences for the past several hundred years, you've got uh, leaders that have an us-them mentality, that have a critics are out to get us, that we're the chosen people. Um, they condemn secularism. They condemn scientists. They condemn science. They condemn journalists. They attack scholars. They attack critics. They attack apostates. Um, they tell their members that you can't raise healthy children if, if, if you're outside of the church, that you have to fear critics and people who leave the church. And they tell you, like any abusive organization, where will you possibly go if you leave the church? You can't be healthy and happy without us. That's all abusive, divisive rhetoric that is more commonly used by literal abusers on their victims. And, um, and, you all know, you've all heard people like Dallin H. Oaks give spew anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. Uh, people like Marky e. Peterson and Ezra Tapp Benson and many, many others spew racist rhetoric, uh, Brigham Young, etc. You know, there is so much divisive rhetoric in the history of Mormonism, including people that Mormon church leaders that oppose the civil rights movement 
and who fought it and who openly encouraged and taught racist teachings. And that takes us to the sixth point, which is a long, long history of picking on vulnerable minorities um, and stoking bigotry. We all know that the Mormon church has a long, horrible history of racism, of sexism, and of homophobia, of making gay and lesbian people feel like they're less than, feel like they're dirty and loathsome, making people of color feel like their skin is dark and evil because of curses from God, um, making, um, making, you know, trying to encourage celibacy or mixed orientation marriages or even reparative therapy for gay and lesbian people. And of course, anti-transgender -tran um, rhetoric that makes um, transgender people and gender non-binary people and others feel like there's no place for them, like God doesn't love and accept them as they are, and like there's something wrong uh, with who they are. And that's why there's such depression and anxiety and divorce and even suicide within Mormonism, at least in part because of all this divisive rhetoric that's so often and way too often targeted at our most vulnerable and discriminated minority populations. And to this day, the church has not fixed and apologized for its racism, its sexism, its anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. It has still not uh, done it. And the church still gives these divisive talks like you have to crawl under or around or over the Book of Mormon like Jeffrey Holland or where will you go? Stay in the boat. Um, you know, all of this rhetoric is divisive and it's harmful and it's damaging and it needs to stop. The seventh parallel between Mormon Orthodox Mormonism and Trumpism is leaders and followers who stay silent out of fear of going against the opinions of their tribe and who value their own perceived immediate self-interest over the long-term interests of the greater community. I can't tell you how many progressive liberal um or even Orthodox Mormons that know that the prophet's wrong on certain issues. They know that the church has a racist past. They know that the church shouldn't be excommunicating people and silencing people, and yet they stay silent. I can't tell you how many progressive and, and non-believing Mormons tell me about these horrific stories that they've experienced, this abuse, institutional abuse, direct horrific stories with top church leadership. And then when I say, well, will you come on in Mormon stories and talk about it? They're like, no, I can't do that. I have a job or my family will be sad or my my my, my parents will be disappointed or I, I may lose some clientele or it's just going to be uncomfortable for me. And by being silent, you are complicit. And Mormonism is rife with people who are complicit, not just in speaking openly about truth claims or in problems with the church, but who do not speak up for on race issues, race issues, who do not speak up on LGBTQ issues, trans issues, who do not speak up for women and do not speak up against the abuses of the Mormon church. Way too much silence uh, within Mormonism. The final uh, parallel I find is again with leaders and followers who encourage and or engage in violence or who stay silent about violence. And Desnat, which is a desert nation, which is a new and emerging movement within Mormonism, is now thriving on Twitter. And even the Mormon church has funded organizations like the Morgan Foundation and Fair Mormon to then fund people like Kwaku um, L and Cardin Ellis, who openly and explicitly encourage and support Desnat and or violence against people like me and Jeremy Runnels and many, many other people, basically anyone who doubts or questions the church. And the Mormon church has done nothing to actively root out Desnat and or uh, people like Kwaku and Cardin Ellis and Fair Mormon and others that literally retweet videos of people like me or Jeremy Runnels having our heads bashed in by active, faithful, believing Mormons. The church has not come out against Desnat. The church has not come out against Fair Mormon and their violent uh, videos and so many other instances. And so, uh, and of course, that's not to mention the Mormon church's history with the Mount Meadows Massacre, the Council of 50, Day Nights, and all that other stuff. So um, i that's my main argument that Mormonism and or Orthodox Christianity has groomed us for fascism and for Trumpism. What I would like to do now is focus, is close in the most constructive way that I can. I'm going to make the argument 
that there are also many good things within Mormonism and that Mormonism has actually taught us many good things that can actually help inoculate us and or show us the way out of the sort of a disposition or proclivity towards Trumpism and or fascism. And the best shining example of this that I can find in or out of Mormonism in the United States, ironically, is a Republican Mormon senator named Mitt Romney. And I did not vote for Romney. I voted for Obama. But uh, I don't know how Republican or Democrat these days, if you're open-minded, if you're objective, you even if you disagree with his policies, I don't know how you can't be inspired by the acts of Mitt Romney in the United States um, in the modern era. He is a man for all seasons. Look up Sir Thomas More, watch the movie A Man for All Seasons. Because what we've seen is there is one Republican, one Republican in the Senate and in Congress who was willing to openly speak out against Donald Trump, not just yesterday, but for months and months and months and even years leading up to this horrific result that happened yesterday. And that's Mormon Senator Mitt Romney. He has shown us courage. He has shown us um, conviction. He has shown us honesty. He cares about the truth. He doesn't uh, glean, he doesn't cling to conspiracy theories. Um, he is brave. He has used responsible rhetoric. He has used non-polarizing rhetoric, um, and he has been warning us and speaking out publicly. He hasn't relied on silence. He hasn't sat quietly in his comfort, and he's actually faced derision and abuse by members of his own party, by members of his own constituency for his courage. And I would like to make the argue that may not make the argument that may not be super popular with some of my listeners or some of you who are out there listening, that there are strains of Mormonism that uh, can encourage the type of truth-loving courage and conviction and integrity that Mitt Romney is shown. And for me, it all comes back to primary songs or hymns, because if I have any res residue or remnant beliefs in parts of Mormonism, they can be found in many of the primary songs or hymns that I learned as a Mormon. And I'm just going to share with you a few of the truths that I learned in Mormonism that actually, in my case, led me out of Orthodox Mormonism, that got me kicked out of the church, and that I see in someone like Mitt Romney, and that I see Orthodox Mormons and believing Mormons and Trump Mormons can consider uh, inspiring them to stop supporting a fascist dictator in America. So the first one is, I learned as a Mormon that truth matters. One of my favorite hymns as a Mormon was, Oh, say what is truth, tis the fairest gem that the riches of world can produce. And priceless the value of truth will be when, listen for it, the proud monarch's costliest diadem is counted but dross and refuse. There's an anti-monarchist line in the first hymn of O oh, Say What is Truth. And I learned to value truth as a Mormon, and I know that somewhere buried in Mormonism is the love for truth. So that's one point of Mormonism that we can all learn for. The second is be courageous. You all know the hymn, do what, do what is right, let the consequence follow. Battle for freedom in spirit and might. And with press heart and with stout hearts leads you forth till tomorrow. God will protect you, then do what is right. Mitt Romney has even quoted uh, that him, I believe, to inspire what he's doing. And I think as Mormons, I hope you, and as progressive Mormons, and as post-Mormons, you can be inspired to be courageous and to do what is right, regardless of whether your parents don't love you, or your community might be happy, or you might lose some clients, or your reputation you worry might be uh, impacted. Go for truth. Go for courage over comfort and convenience. I learned that as a Mormon. 
And it's not a uniquely Mormon thing, by the way, but it is something that you can find in Mormonism. The third point is be brave. Um, dare to do right, dare to be true. You have a work that no other can do. Do it so bravely, so kindly, so well. Angels will hasten the story to tell. Dare, dare, dare to do right. Dare, dare, dare to be true. Dare to be true. Dare to be true. That's a Mormon song. That's a Mormon hymn that can inspire us all during a time where too many people are 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 afraid and not courageous enough to do what is right. The next song from Mormonism that we all can learn from is, to, the principle is to be kind. And you all know the song. I want to be kind to everyone, for that is right, you see. So I say to myself, remember this, kindness begins with me. We don't need to use hateful rhetoric. We don't need to use profanity. We don't need to use harsh words condemning and criticizing everyone around us. And we especially need to be most kind to the vulnerable and to the people that need our love and support most and who need to be lifted. Um, and again, it's a primary song by my dear friend, Carolyn Pearson, that again shows up and teaches us how to act with vulnerable populations. If you don't walk like most people do, some people walk away from you, but I won't, I won't. If you don't talk as most people do, some people smile and laugh at you, but I won't, I won't. I'll walk with you, I'll talk with you, that's how I'll show my love for you. Jesus walked away from none, he gave his love to everyone, so I will, I will. Jesus blessed all he could see, then turned and said, come follow me, and I will, I will, I will. I will, I'll walk with you, I'll talk with you, that's how I'll show my love for you. People of color, immigrants, trans people, gay and lesbian people, gender non-binary people, women, people with, with, uh, um, with disabilities, they deserve our love and our kindness. They don't deserve to be demonized at worst, and at best, told that there's no place for them in the kingdom with no doctrine and no theology that accommodates them. We can do better, and it can be Mormonism who can inspire us to do better. And a shout out again to Carolyn Pearson for that song. The final song that I want to share with you today is In Our Lovely Deseret. In Our Lovely Deseret, where the saints of God has met there's probably a better song out there, but the point is, is we as Mormons, the beehive of Mormonism represents community and we care about the community more than we care about in any individual leader, any individual charismatic leader or prophet. We care about the Mormon people. And I learned to care about the Mormon people. I learned to care about the American people, uh, and the, the world, the people of the world as a Mormon. And we need to transcend our ideologies, our, our reverence and obedience to leaders. We need to, trans, we need to transcend all of that and start caring about uh, our, our, our world, our world population, America as a whole, and the Mormon people as a whole, instead of uh, political ideology, and especially instead of charismatic, fascist-like religious leaders. To close, I'm going to share with you a summary of what we need. We need people who do not tolerate hero worship or overconfidence in charismatic leadership. We need people who allow and even welcome a culture of constructive criticism. We need people, Mormon and American, who are willing to hold their leaders directly accountable with criticism and 
otherwise, valuing the common good over questioning devotion to unquestioning devotion to their leaders and their tribe. We need people who actively seek credible evidence, Mormons and Americans and people in the world who are willing to reconsider and even set aside their superstitious beliefs in the face of credible evidence, including people who reject baseless conspiracy theories. We need, we need people who seek to use constructive bridge-building language and not divisive, hateful rhetoric. We need people who will reject all bigoted speech and who seek to protect and empower and lift up minorities and vulnerable populations. We need people who are willing to speak uh, up they don't stay quiet, and they're willing to speak up, even when it goes against their personal comfort, their personal privilege, even when it might impact them financially, it might impact their relationship with friends and family or the community. We need people who will speak up because silence is complicity. Silence is the killer, and silence is what enables fascism and tyranny and religious fundamentalism. And finally, we need people um, who reject uh, any type of violence, verbal or physical, and who are willing to communicate candidly but with kindness, and most of all, people who care about the, the community over their own ideologies, their own parties, their own religious beliefs. We need people that care about mankind, humankind, the world, not just uh, their tribes. So, Thank you so much for listening today. If any of you made it through to the end of this, I owe you an ice cream cone. I owe you a steak dinner. I'll throw a party when COVID is over and invite all of you who listen to this um, to get together and we can have a huge celebration in anti-fascism, in anti-Trumpism, uh, in anti-fundamentalist religious um, celebration. And I just want to say thank you for listening. Please share your comments and questions. And if you enjoyed this presentation, if you valued it, please consider sharing it, sharing it on Facebook, sharing it on Instagram, sharing it on Twitter, sharing it with friends and family. And if you don't, I still ask you to consider the things that we've talked about today, because I believe it will make Mormonism a better place. It will make ex-Mormonism and liberal progressive Mormon. I am going to take these principles and internalize them myself. I'm going to try and be more loving, less divisive, more kind. Uh, more based on evidence, less based on conspiracy theories. I call on ex-Mormons and progressive Mormons uh, and, you know, everyone else, Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you vote for. These principles apply to everyone, religious and not, Republican, conservative, neutral, people outside the U.S., I call on everyone to consider these principles, and I'm going to do my best to follow these as well. And whenever I step out of line, I rely on you, my listeners, friends, family, to call me on it. And I promise to double down my efforts to engage in, in uh, to follow my own uh, wisdom and uh, my own recommendations. So anyway, love you guys. Thanks so much. Please spread the word. And uh, thanks for everyone who supports what I do. And I uh, hope you guys will stay in touch. And I'd love to hear from you guys if you valued this presentation or if you have criticisms of this presentation. I want to hear that too, because again, I'm going to eat my own dog food. Thanks, everybody. Take care. And uh, um, God and secularism bless America. God and secularism bless the world. God and secularism uh, bless uh, Mormonism and post-Mormonism. And, uh, and uh, let's all choose healing and growth and thriving in the weeks, months, years ahead. Let's love each other and most importantly, be kind. Thanks everybody. Take care.